Again, good Sabbath to everybody. It's great to have you with us on this Sabbath day. Now, how many of us have heard the term or the phrase, boiling the frog? Well, the concept here is if you drop a live frog into a pot of boiling water, he'll immediately jump out to save himself. I think everybody would figure that would make sense. His body senses the extreme heat and he automatically jumps to safety. But on the other hand, if you place a frog into a pot of water at room temperature, the frog might just be comfortable and might just sit quietly in the water. If we were to increase the temperature of the water in the pot by, let's say, one degree maybe every ten minutes, this slight change in temperature over time would not be noticeable to the frog. It's very gradual. The temperature would eventually rise to the lethal levels, but at no point would the frog ever actually become alarmed. The frog would die but he never saw it coming. From the website, idioms.thefreedictionary.com slash boiling plus frog, here's her definition of this idiom, boiling the frog. Here's what they say. Quote, It's a problematic situation that will gradually increase in severity until it reaches calamitous proportions, such that the people involved or affected by it will not notice the danger until it is too late to act. It's a metaphor, taken from the anecdotal parable about boiling a frog, in which a frog placed in boiling water will immediately try to save itself. But one placed in cool water that is gradually brought to a boil will not notice the heat until it is boiled to death. End quote. Now I'm going to talk more about the literally the literal boiling of a frog by slowly raising the temperature of the water a little later on in a day sermon. But you know, people's attitudes and beliefs can be the same way. Often if we want to get people to change their ways or their beliefs, we need to change them slowly. We need to bring about change slowly and subtly. The idea here is that if change comes all at once, it's obvious, it's abrupt. Most people will reject it outright. Now, the frog will notice the hot water being a big change in temperature and jump out of the pan. As we said, if the frog is comfortable in the water and the temperature increases just slightly every little bit, the frog is unlikely to become alarmed at any given time. You know, one hour we change it one degree, the next another degree, and it will likely go unnoticed. So eventually the frog would die from the heat, but he never really noticed a major change in temperature at any given point. And by the time the water boils... It's too late. The frog is dead. Again, I have more to say about this in a little bit. But what does all this have to do with our Heavenly Father? Or Jesus Christ, or the church for that matter? I mean, why am I talking about this today? Well, I believe that the Christian church is also slowly and surely being destroyed, just as the frog was in my example. You know, Satan was to appear to the average Christian today and say, Follow me. How many would abruptly abandon Christ and follow Satan? Well, today there might actually be a few, not many. But the vast majority of Christians would probably say something like, Get thee behind me, Satan, or go away. I'm not going to be fooled. Most would never intentionally turn away from Christ and follow Satan. Just like if you suddenly placed a frog in boiling water, he'd jump right out, realizing this sudden change is not a good thing. But suddenly very slowly raising the temperature of the water would eventually kill the frog without the frog ever realizing what was happening to him. Now Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 tells us, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Now Satan acts in a subtle manner. He deceives us into believing lies. He tricks us into abandoning God, God's ways and His commandments, and into doing what He wants us to do. You know, Satan told Eve it was okay to eat of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even though God had commanded Eve not to. Satan assured Eve that she would not die, as God had said. And when Eve looked at the tree, she saw it look good to her. It seemed to be good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. Hey, it might even make her wise, like Satan said. What's not to like? And, you know, Satan said it was okay. But we now know 
that simple mistake had catastrophic consequences for all of humanity. All it took was to turn away from God's commandments just for a moment. Eve, listening to Satan and deciding in her own mind that this would be okay, was an incredible disaster. Now, what's the lesson here? I believe it to be twofold. Well, first, never listen to Satan. That's the first thing. And second, never doubt God. Never doubt God's Word. Always trust God to tell us the truth and tell us what's in our best interest. He loves us, after all. We can trust Him. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, if you would. That's 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5. In verse 8, we need to always follow the commands of God and never, ever let our human nature, never, ever let our pride allow us to think that we know better than our Creator. Because if we do, let's just read 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. Now, Eve fell for Satan's lies, his deception. She decided that what looked right in her eyes, well, that was the way to go. But you know, Proverbs 16, verse 25 tells us, I'm sure you remember this, there is a way that seems right unto a man or a woman, but the end thereof of are the ways of death. Now, Eve and Adam certainly found out that this is true. But Satan didn't force Eve to sin. She did it willingly. Whether coerced by Satan or not, she made the choice to depart from God's word and sin. And of course, Adam joined her in this, so he didn't fare any better. But we have one advantage that Adam and Eve did not have. Our Bibles show us time and time again what happens when we depart from God's commandments and decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. And often, like Eve, you know, Satan's influence assists us in these bad decisions. So, okay, let's say if, if Satan directly tells one of us to eat of a certain fruit that God's forbidden, I think most of, most of us will say, oh, no, you don't. We saw that trick before. We're not falling for that again. But Satan is not only smart, he's also subtle. As we said, he'll come at us subtly. Today, like turning up the temperature slowly on that frog, Satan is satisfied with small, incremental changes to our worship of our Creator. He's happy with that. Changes that are so slight, so subtle, that most don't even take notice. Until, like the frog, we, or I might say Christianity, ultimately becomes destroyed. And most of us never saw it coming. The whole world is being deceived today. Revelation 12, verse 9 tells us that Satan deceives the whole world. How's he managing that? Well, by doing what Satan does best, by enticing us to disbelieve God, to believe that we know better than God. You've probably heard some churches teach God's commandments were done away with. But of course, Jesus tells us repeatedly to keep the commandments. We have heard from some, I have. The Old Testament's obsolete. We shouldn't even bother to look at it. But in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When this was written, there was no New Testament. All Scriptures were contained in the Old Testament at that time. And I could go on and on. I have before. But as we turn away from the Word of God found throughout our Bibles, as we decide what we think is right, what we think God will be okay with, what should we expect to happen? Well, we already saw what happened to Adam and Eve, and it wasn't good. Unfortunately, man didn't learn his lesson even after seeing what happened to Adam and Eve, and he hasn't learned from the world as they have rejected the commands of God with obviously disastrous results. Do you ever maybe think what the world might be like today? if everyone actually followed God's commandments, if no one ever stole anything, if no one ever lied, if no one ever disrespected their parents. There was no adultery, let alone all the other forms of sexual sin we see today. 
if there were no murders, no idols, no false gods being worshipped? Can we imagine a world where everyone keeps God's commandments, where everyone truly loves God and truly loves the rest of us? And if we can, then we've just seen a glimpse of God's coming kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? But we can't succumb to Satan's deception. We can't give an inch. We must always do our very best to worship God in spirit and in truth. Very important in truth. You need to respect God and acknowledge Him as our Creator. To acknowledge that He does know what's best for us. And to admit that man's ways continue to fail and that only God knows best. That truly following Jesus Christ is the only way to true peace and happiness. Today, I'd like to look at what has happened to Christianity as it has moved away from the gospel of Jesus Christ that He brought, the gospel of the kingdom. As Christians have looked to men for leadership rather than God, what's happened? And in particular, I'd like to look at what, in my opinion, is one of the greatest victories for Satan. What I consider one of the greatest deceptions that has ever occurred since the Garden of Eden. Not only that, but a deception that Christians are voluntarily propagating themselves this very day. But first, let's look at a Let's look at a very look, I'm sorry, let's take a very brief look at how we got to this point. Turn with me, if you would, to Galatians 1, verse 6. How did we get here? Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. Now, we got here by, as we were talking about with the frog, by slowly moving away from the truth. And this slow moving away from the Word of God was going on even in Jesus' day. Again, in Galatians 1 and verse 6. We'll see what Paul has to say to the Galatians about this very thing. Galatians 1 and verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. Well, this was not actually the good news they were spreading. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But the we or an angel from heaven, and preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men, or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. We can see that People were abandoning the true God and the words in this Holy Bible, even in Jesus' day. But of course, it didn't stop there. Now fast forward around 300 years. So around 325 AD, the Romans, particularly Emperor Constantine, made laws regarding, uh, concerning religion. We talked about this before, so I won't get into it again. But you know, one of the major changes affecting Christianity was to prohibit worship on the Sabbath day and make Sunday the weekly day of worship. Sunday was named the Day of the Lord and became the new day of worship. Now, there was resistance to this at the time. Now, the Jews absolutely refused, and they fled. They wanted no part of this. But those that stayed, most everyone else, changed their day of worship rather than suffer the penalty of law if they refused. But, come on, was it really such a big deal to worship God on a different day of the week? I mean, we're still worshiping God, right? No. Another major change was to abandon God's seven annual holy days and to begin to observe pagan holy days. But of course, by substituting Jesus Christ as the name of this of the false deities, basically. But again, hey, we're we're worshiping Jesus Christ. Maybe not in the way that He commanded us to, but it'll be okay. I mean, He'll accept our worship in whatever form we decide. Right? Well, there are some major differences between the seventh day Sabbath and Sunday, for example, and between God's seven annual holy days and man's holidays, maybe besides the obvious. Let me explain an important difference between God's holy days and man's Sundays and holidays, something maybe we didn't think about. 
God didn't just sanctify the seventh day of the week and make it holy or set it apart or consecrated it. He explains to us why it's set apart and how we are to observe it. He gives us commandments on how we're to observe it. Leviticus 23, if you would. That's Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 3. Leviticus 23 and verse 3. I'd like us to notice that God gave us specific instructions regarding how we are to observe his appointed times, all his appointed times. So again, Leviticus 23, verse 3, for God's instructions regarding his weekly Sabbath day. Here he says, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. We can read about all God's holy days here in Leviticus 23, both his weekly and annual holy days. We hear, though, that God specifically, excuse me, <clears throat> God specifically commands us to work on the first six days of the week. And that, of course, includes Sunday, the first day of the week. He tells us to rest on the seventh day and to have a holy convocation on this day. Now, that's simple and easy to understand. We're to take a break from our daily work and rest for his example, the one he gave to us at creation. That's what God commands us to do for the Sabbath that he created for us. Remember, Jesus tells us in Matthew 2, verse 27, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not created for the Jews. It was created for man. Before all the women get upset with me, the word translated in, as man in Matthew 2, verse 27, it's a Greek word, anthropos. It actually means a human being. The Sabbath was created for all humans, for all of us. And not just the Jews or just for males, but all of us. I think I'm digressing here, but my point is that God's consecrated and set apart weekly Sabbath has specific instructions from God as to how we are to observe it. In Jesus' day, people rested from their work and assembled themselves together per God's instructions. Now, Sunday, of course, was never declared to be a holy day by God. But most Christians do go to church on Sunday now. But they often work, shop, well, they do just about anything they want on Sunday after they attend church. Those that keep Sunday might consider their time attending church on that day to be holy, although God never actually declared it to be so. But outside of their church meeting time, there seems to be nothing holy about the rest of the day. As I said, Sunday keepers might work go shopping, do whatever on Sunday. They don't set aside the entire day of Sunday to rest and make God their focus. How's God feel about that? Well, that's okay. Because God actually instructed us to work on this day. There are no commandments about resting or even assembling weekly on Sunday, the first day of the week. As a result, the modern Sabbath, as some people might try to call it, or Sunday, has become a watered-down counterfeit of God's holy seventh-day Sabbath. But, you know, people are at least meeting for a while on Sundays anyway and spending time in God's Word. So again, is this really all that bad? You know, years ago, people rested on Sunday, many believing it was God's Sabbath. Now, when I was young, most all the families I knew, including my own, rested. They didn't work on Sunday. But as time went on, we see that today most Christians treat Sunday as any other day of the week, at least as soon as they get out of church. Sunday is no longer considered by Christians to be a 24-hour holy day. That is, if it ever really was. But as bad as this is, this situation is even worse when it comes to the loss of God's seven annual holy days and the establishment of man's holidays. God's seven annual appointed times, his annual holy days, teach us about his plan of salvation. And like God's weekly Sabbath days, God instructs us as to how we should observe his annual holy days as well. He gives us specific instructions. For the past seven years, 
I personally have spoken on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, that's God's sixth annual holy day of the year. While my message might not be exactly the same each year, I never fail to read Scripture, such as Leviticus 23, verses 33 through 44, and Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through 29. And these are where God gives us his instructions on how to observe this time of year, how to observe his appointed times. And we follow God's instructions on observing these holy days every year, year after year. You can look at Nehemiah chapter 8 and see that they were keeping the Feast of Tabernacles back then, just as we do every year today. Our customs didn't change because they were established by our Creator who is the same yesterday and today and forever. Our holy days that God gave us, they don't change. The message of God's holy days don't change. They're there to teach us righteousness and about God's true gospel, His plan for us year after year. God's message and His plan for us does not change. Those of us that observe God's holy days are taught the same important lessons year after year. And year after year, we learn to grow closer and closer to God, which is why they're there in the first place. Okay. Now, for man's holidays, man's and, I should say, Satan's substitute for God's consecrated holy days. Now, like Sunday, these holidays come with no instructions from God as to how to observe them. Since they were created by men, there are no real rules to follow, other than whatever man decides is right in his own eyes. We saw how dangerous that can be earlier today. And as we decide what is right, we ignore what God says. Therefore, today's holidays really have no set rules, certainly no rules from God. And today I'd like to use Christmas as our example of man's substituted holidays for God's holy days since we're in that season right now. Now, this applies to most all holidays, but this is a specific one we'll talk about today. I'm not sure how many are aware of this, but Christmas itself has evolved over time. It's changed and continues to change even today. And lacking God's authority, actually lacking any real authority, it continues to evolve. You know, when Christmas was first declared to be a holiday, most Christians rejected it, being very well aware of its ungodly pagan origin and customs. But eventually, slowly, think of the frog, it became more popular. And just last Sabbath, I mentioned that keeping Christmas in some of the early colonies of the United States was punish punishable by a fine. But, again, slowly Christmas finally caught on. But early on, you know, Christians that observed it tend to focus more on Jesus Christ. But today it's become more commercialized and the focus of this day has definitely shifted. We hear people screaming, we need to put Christ back into Christmas. The problem is, as you've also heard, Jesus Christ was never part of Christmas. But worse yet, those that teach about Christmas today teach things that aren't even true. As we read earlier, it's like Paul said, they're preaching a different gospel, which really isn't good news at all. For an example, think about this. I mean, seriously think about it. The Ninth Commandment tells us not to lie, right? Do those who teach us about Christmas really instruct us to worship in spirit and in truth? And indeed are Christ, uh, Christians who observe Christmas worshiping in spirit and in truth. Well, here are just some of the things that are consistently taught about Christmas today. I think we're all familiar with those, but first, Jesus was born on December 25th. I think it's common knowledge that Jesus was not born on December 25th. That was the alleged birthday of the false gods. Most know that Jesus Christ was not born on December 5th, 25th. They keep on pretending and saying that he was anyway. And we, of course, we see nativity scenes everywhere this time of year. We see the Magi visiting Jesus on the night of his birth. But the Bible tells us that the Magi found Jesus as a young child and in a house, not as an infant in a manger. Yet churches put up these scenes anyway. 
Now, I hear what I can hear what you're saying. Some of you are saying, come on, Alan, so what? This doesn't really hurt anything. I mean, after all, what difference does it make? I mean, aren't you being a little overly critical here? After all, hey, we're worshiping Jesus Christ, and that's the important thing. I hear you. But is it acceptable to God to propagate something that we know is false? Is God pleased if we tell even small, seemingly inconsequential lies? Got a story for you here. Several, several years ago, I was invited to a company Christmas party where I worked. I respectfully declined the invitation. I just stayed at my work and planned to continue to work during that period. Well, about the time the party was to begin, I got a visit from our minister, one who represented our agency. He was a nice man. And he encouraged me to come to the party. Now, it was nice of him to think of me, it really was, but again, I politely refused. But he seemed genuinely interested about why I seemed to be refusing to attend the party. And I was kind of reluctant to talk about it at first, Eventually, he suggested that my refusal to participate might be due to the pagan traditions of Christian of Christmas. Well, I admitted that, yes, this was a large part of it. I also objected to the idea of playing Santa Claus, which suddenly was going on in there. But he said that, you know, come on, this is all just pretend. It's just for fun. He said, didn't you ever play pretend with your children when they were little? Didn't you ever tell your children nursery rhymes or stories that were not literally true? I mean, it's the same thing. So I don't see the problem. I said, well, yeah, I suppose I probably have played pretend with my children before. But it was understood, or at least I believe, that everyone knew we were playing pretend. If a child had asked me if something was real or pretend, I'd be very quick to point out that, no, it, we're just pretending. Or that... That cow did not literally jump over the moon. I mean, you know, that, it's not true. But there's a difference. At Christmas time, parents tell their children about Santa Claus. But this is not pretend. If a very young child asks their parents if Santa is real, the parents will over and over again affirm that he is. And check it out. But if Santa is pretend then who is it that's bringing them all those literal, physical presents each year? That's not pretend. That's real. So the children are reinforced to believe that this is true. They're not told the truth. And when a child begins to mature and the parents suspect they can't keep this deception up any longer, they'll finally admit that there is no such thing as Santa Claus. But up until that point, the parents, grandparents, etc., will often go to great lengths to make their children believe that Santa is real. They go to great lengths to make this seem real to them. This goes far beyond pretend, a simple pretend story, way beyond that. Of course, my question is often, why? Why do parents work so hard to deceive their children into believing in a fictitious man who showers them with presents once every year? I mean, what's the point in the lengths they go to to do this? I also think to myself, can we imagine what things would be like if Christian parents today would teach their children about Jesus Christ with the same zeal and intensity as they teach them about Santa Claus? We'd have something there, wouldn't we? But for hundreds of years now, we've been slowly turning up the heat on the frog. For years, Christians have accepted small changes to God's laws and commandments. Santa Claus would have never been taught by Jesus' original disciples. A major change like that all at once would have never been accepted. But after hundreds of years of smaller changes, Christianity has moved farther and farther away from the gospel Jesus Christ brought until we find ourselves where we are today. But again, I have people tell me, hey, is playing Santa Claus all that bad, really? Well, I'd like to suggest to us today that Santa Claus is not just a harmless pretend game. Just as Sunday is a counterfeit for God's holy weekly Sabbath day, and as our holidays today are counterfeits of God's annual holy days, His sacred appointed times, 
I believe that Santa Claus is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ, just as all the past gods were. Now, it's a big claim. Do I have any evidence to support my claim? What do you think? Well, most are familiar with the characteristics of Santa Claus. They've seen it on television for years, had it in books, but maybe never considered them to be the same characteristics of Jesus Christ. Many are the same. But of course, we would expect a counterfeit to have many of the characteristics of the real thing, will we not? If Santa Claus is a ca counterfeit of Jesus Christ, as I claim, then we should see similar characteristics. That's what a counterfeit is. But they're not perfect. Remember that. So if you would turn with me to Revelation 1.13, let's take a look at some of these things. It's Revelation 1, verse 13. And let's compare the characteristics of Santa Claus with the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Today you can decide for yourselves if Santa Claus is a counterfeit, a substitute for Jesus Christ, or it's just a coincidence. I'll try to go slow to give us time to get to these passages. I think it's very important to see it for ourselves, so you might want to turn to these. So again, let's go first to Revelation 1, verse 13. Here's what we read, and this is going to be about Christ. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now again, this is describing Christ. Verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. We see here in Revelation that Christ's hair is white. White as snow, in fact. Of course, what color is Santa's hair? Of course, it's white. Coincidence? Maybe. Let's, let's go ahead here. Let's look over to Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. Yeah, I hear some groaning out there. No, we're, we'll see what we can do with this. Maybe a coincidence here so far, but Isaiah 50, verse 6. Now, back in verse 1 of uh, Isaiah 50, it begins with, Thus says the Lord. So this is what the Lord's saying to us. So verse 6, Isaiah 50, verse 6. This is the contemporary English version, by the way. He says, I let them beat my back and pull out my beard. So we see here that Christ has a beard. Does anyone know if Santa has a beard? You bet he does. Of course, this. that's okay. So Santa has a beard. Jesus Christ is said to have a beard. Revelation chapter 19. Let's go there next view. That's Revelation chapter 19, and we'll go to verse 13. It's Revelation chapter 19 and verse 13. Now, this is speaking of the return of our true Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's the subject here, and it's going to tell us what he's wearing when he returns. So Revelation chapter 19 and verse 13. And he, that's Jesus Christ, and he was clothed, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So clothing dipped in blood would be what color? Red, obviously, right. Christ is wearing red when he returns. What color does Santa wear when he returns every year? What's his main color? Red. Red. Hmm. Next, turn to Mark chapter 6, if you would. That's Mark chapter 6, we'll go to verse 3. But what are the odds that both Santa and Jesus Christ wear the same color at the return. Well, again, this could be coincidence, I suppose. And we're going to Mark 6, verse 3, but in, in previous verse, uh, Mark 6, verse 2, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. And let's see what Jesus had to I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> let's see what the people had to say about Jesus. Mark 6, verse 3. Here's what they said. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James? We know that Jesus was a carpenter. I think everybody knows that. Most of us also know that Santa Claus is said to have a workshop. Now, this workshop is seen in movies and TV specials and books. It's very common. It's said to be at the North Pole. But Santa has been known as a carpenter. Now, I agree that the trend today is toward more electronic toys, but traditionally, Santa was a carpenter, producing many wooden toys, at least in the past. Traditionally, Santa has been known as a carpenter. 
Just the same occupation that Jesus Christ had. Amazing. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verse 20. That's Psalm 103, verse 20. Well, I think the coincidences are beginning to pile up a little bit here, but maybe we're not convinced just yet. I know these, these still could be a coincidence, I guess. Let's keep going. Psalm 103, verse 20. It says, Bless the Lord, you his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Well, it's no secret that Jesus has angels as servants. They listen to him and they follow his commandments. I think we all know that. But does Santa also have servants to help him? What are they called? They're called elves. Now, what exactly is an elf? Well, in the Dru Druidic religion, elves are known as demons. And, of course, we know demons as fallen angels. Christ has angels as servants. Santa, he has elves or perhaps fallen angels as servants. So I believe both uh, Jesus and Santa have servants, servants that are, in fact, angels. Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 6. Revelation 19, verse 6. You know, I have to admit that even I didn't realize that Santa had so many characteristics of Jesus Christ until I seriously looked into this. It's pretty amazing. But anyway, Revelation 19, verse 6. Looking for more characteristics of Jesus Christ. And I heard as if it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Well, Christ is omnipotent, meaning almighty or infinite in power. I think most of us know that. But what about Santa Claus? Well, there seems to be no limit to what Santa can do. He can do anything. He can make any toy. He can grant any wish. At least it's what we tell our children. And sure enough, in their letters to Santa Claus, they get intercepted. Chris, uh, children actually ask Santa to heal family members and to help parents find jobs when they're unemployed. It's not just about toys. Children are taught and believe that Santa can do anything. To them, Santa is omnipotent. Santa is omnipotent. Psalm 139. So I know we got a lot of scriptures here, but uh, I think it's important to see them. Psalm 139, beginning in verse 7. That's Psalm 139 and verse 7. What about God's presence? Can we hide from God? Can we hide from Santa Claus? Again, Psalm 139, verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I free from your presence? If I send up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell or the grave, behold, you are there. God is everywhere. We can't hide from God because he's omnipresent. Now, if you think about it, Santa is also everywhere at the same time. Now, if we were to visit several malls in the same evening, we'd find Santa at every one of them at the same time. And also, if you think about it, it's a physical impossibility that Santa could visit every house on Christmas Eve. Like at the malls, he would need to be everywhere, basically at the same time. Well, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But it seems that Satan also appears to be omnipresent. Did I say Satan? I do this all the time. Okay. God is omnipresent. <laughs> Santa also appears to be omnipresent. But so does Satan. So see, I was still right. Okay. I'm still right. <laughs> okay. At least I think I am. Uh, let's, let, let's get out of here quickly and go to 1 John 3, verse 20, before I make things even worse. 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 20. I do this every time. And it's easy to do because uh, Satan and Santa are very similar. Uh, it's easy to transpose those letters. But again, let's, uh, let's get uh, to 1 John 3, verse 20. 
And God and Santa may be everywhere at the same time, but they really know what's in our hearts. Do they know everything? Again, 1 John 3, verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. God knows all things. He's omniscient. He's omniscient. But we know that children can't keep secrets from Santa. He knows if they've been good or bad. Just like God, Santa is omniscient. He knows all things. Second Timothy. If you would, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. We might all remember that song about Santa. I won't try to sing it, but it goes something like this. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Because Santa knows. We can't fool Santa just as we cannot fool Jesus Christ. But again, let's go to here to 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. See what we have here. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, meaning the living, and the dead, that is appearing in his kingdom. So we see here that clearly Christ judges. He judges people. Well, parents tell their children that if they're good, Santa will bring them toys. Now, why is this? Because Santa judges. Now, if Santa judges that we're good, what happens? Well, we get toys, candy, or some other kind of reward. Now, if we're just to be bad, we might get a lump of coal instead. That was an old tradition here in the United States, but in some cultures, if Santa judges one to be bad, the Krampus... Now, the Krampus is a subject for another time, but if, one, if Santa judges one to be bad, the Krampus carries the bad person, usually children, to hell, often in a handbasket. Don't take my word for this. Check it out for yourself. I found it hard to believe in myself. But Santa judges, and if we're good, we get toys, trinkets, or maybe some candy. Christ judges. He judges, too. And if we've repented of sin and are good, does he give us toys or trinkets like Santa does? Not exactly. We get the much greater gift of eternal life. Santa's rewards don't compare to the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Keep in mind that counterfeits aren't exactly perfect. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. We're getting to the end here. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. I think we also know, and most of this is common knowledge, Santa Claus is centered around young children. Is there any comparison between Jesus Christ and Santa Claus when it comes to children? Well, again, Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. Reading about Christ again. Mark 10, verse 13. And they brought young children to him, meaning Jesus, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said to them, Suffer the little children to come to me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Christ wants us to bring our children to him. What about Santa? Santa wants us to bring our children to him. In fact, he shows up at malls and other places and just waits for the children to show up. He waits for them. He knows they're coming. And he loves to have them sit in his lap. Now, I know the COVID pandemic may have slowed this down a bit, but parents still bring their children to Santa to sit in his lap. Right? See it all the time. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1, if you would. Chapter 1, verse 8, that's Hebrews. Chapter 1, verse 8. So, children are taught to ask Santa for their wants and needs. Instead of God, who is in truth the one that gives us everything we have. 
And when the children are brought to see Santa, when they're brought to sit on Santa's lap and give him their wishes or their prayers, you might say, where is Santa himself sitting? Where is he sitting? Again, Hebrews 1 verse 8. This is Christ. But unto the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So we know that Christ sits on a throne. If you've ever been to a mall where Santa was, or anywhere he was probably, you know that Santa also sits on a throne. Christ sits on a throne. Santa sits on a throne. Wow. Well, we're at the throne thing. Let's go to Revelation 20, if you would, verse 12. Revelation 20, verse 12. What is the significance of sitting on a throne? Well, that typically denotes that one is a ruler. The one who, has, one who has the power to judge and pronounce sentence even. They rule. They sit on their thrones. Again, Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now Christ judges people of what they've done based on what's written in the books of the law. But Satan also keeps a list of people and their deeds. He judges based on this list. He knows who's naughty and who's nice. He's even, even said to check his list twice. Right? He knows who's been naughty and who's been nice. Checks his list. So Santa, just like Christ, judges. Let's turn next to Revelation chapter 3. That's Revelation chapter 3 and also verse 3. It makes it easy. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3. Now this is speaking of Christ's second coming. So the question might be, in what manner does Christ return? In what manner does Christ return? Let's look at Revelation 3 verse 3 for the answer. And he says, Remember therefore how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore you shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. So we see here that Christ comes as a thief. The hour? It's unknown. Well, on Christmas Eve, children are typically sent to bed early. Not allowed to stay up late. Now they know Santa's coming, just like we know Christ is coming. But they don't know exactly when. Does Santa Claus knock on the door and ask permission to enter? No, he sneaks down the chimney in the middle of the night and gains entry as a thief. Santa comes in the, as a thief in the night. Isn't that amazing? He does. Santa comes as a thief in the night. The hour? Is unknown. Wow. You know, Santa's been known by a few of the names as well. You may be familiar with some of them, but one is Chris Kringle. You may have heard him called Chris Kringle before. Now, this is not necessarily a similarity. Well, I guess it is. If you look up in the freedictionary.com, the definition for Chris Kringle, look it up if you want. It's the freedictionary.com. Look for the definition of Chris Kringle, and here's what it says. Chris Kringle is, quote, chiefly another name for Santa Claus, close quote. Well, that's no surprise. Let me read the rest of the definition. Let me read the whole definition again to you, the whole thing. Quote, chiefly another name for Santa Claus changed from German Christkindle, meaning little Christ child, close quote. Chris Kringle literally means Christ child. So at Christmas time, when everyone claims to be celebrating the birth of Christ, the name they often use, Chris Kringle, actually refers to Santa Claus as being their Christ, their Messiah. Well, there are even more similar characteristics, but we need to stop here, I think. I think we've got enough. I think we, have, uh, we should have plenty of evidence that Santa Claus is not just some random fable. In fact, he is a false god. A counterfeit God. 
He's worshipped by children all over the world. Why? Because Christians' parents teach their children to do so. They teach their little children to worship Santa Claus, the counterfeit, rather than Jesus Christ, our true Lord and Savior. They teach their children to worship Santa Claus as they would a God. But the very first command, excuse me, the very first commandment tells us, Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Yet billions of Christians across the world do just that. They teach their children to have other gods before him. So we're going to ask the question, is this just harmless fun? How does God feel about teaching our children to worship a false god? Let's look at, let's find out and uh, turn to Mark chapter 9, if you would. That's Mark chapter 9, verse 42. How does Jesus Christ feel about teaching our children to break the first commandment and commit sin, which is what they're doing? Again, that's Mark chapter 9 and verse 42. Here's what he says. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone was hanged about his neck and he was cast into the sea. Well, first off, we don't want to have our millstone put around our neck and be cast into the sea. So how do we go about avoiding offending these little children? Well, the word offend here in verse 42 is the Greek skandalizo. What does it mean? If you know what it means, we know how to avoid uh, this uh, situation where we need to be thrown into the sea. It means to scandalize, to entice to sin. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're enticing the children to sin by breaking God's first commandment and having a God before them other than Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. Today, sadly, we find the majority of those calling themselves Christians enticing their children to sin. How could that have happened to Christianity? How could that possibly have happened? Well, I believe it's happened by boiling the frog, by centuries of compromise, by accepting small changes over time. As I said, Christ's disciples in his day would have never considered playing Santa Claus. But Paul warned us that there would be those who would pervert the gospel, the very truth of God. It was happening even in his day. We've seen God's commandments and his holy days removed over time. We've seen pagan holy days become Christian holidays. While these holidays have no authority from God, that makes them free to change into whatever man wants them to be. There are no rules. December 25th was never Christ's birthday, but Christians just pretended it was. We abandoned God's commandments about how to worship Him and came up with our own, or bar them. We've even presented a false God to our children called Santa Claus. But this isn't the end. Christmas continues to evolve. The last few years we've seen things like, well, I've seen them anyway, he hadn't seen before, things like secret Santa parties. We've got Elf on a Shelf. We continue to move farther into idolatry and farther and farther away from Jesus Christ until one day he too will disappear completely from Christmas and all the other man-made holidays. Without our commitment to Jesus Christ and his commandments, Christianity is all set to one day become so watered down that it will disappear completely. That's where we're heading. The frog is nearing the boiling point, but no one seems to notice and maybe no one seems to care. Satan is boiling the frog. And like the frog, small changes over time will eventually lead to the destruction of Christianity altogether. Now, in the interest of worshiping in spirit and in truth on the Sabbath day, I need to say that many sources claim that a frog will notice that the water is getting too hot at some point and escape by jumping out of the water. And I'm going to leave you with that. So while our example today might not be technically accurate, I want to make sure we tell the truth here, this message is very true. Now, I hope that that frog would actually jump out of the water before he'd be destroyed. 
And like that poor frog, I pray that all of us who may not have noticed what has happened to Christianity over the years, that we'll wake up before it's too late. That we'll wake up and jump out of this and return to our true God. That we will abandon all the counterfeits of God. That we'll keep His commandments and His true ways of love and happiness that will return to Him. His commandments. His real holy days. And grow up to be like His Son, our great Savior Jesus Christ, and not like some other false god as some teach their children today. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. That's 2 Timothy chapter 4. Start there in verse 1. I'd like to end today with some advice from the Apostle Paul. Today, I've tried to do what he's instructed us to do. We need to forget about the modern-day fables and return to worship our Creator in spirit and, importantly, very importantly, in truth. Again, to end today, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. Here's what Paul says. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Not some false gospel. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering or patience and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. <laughs> what did Paul ever know what was going to happen? Here's what he says to us. Verse 5. But watch you in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. For I am now ready to be offered. And at the time of my departure, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Which is exactly what we need to do. The true faith. Not, not the fake faith. Not the false gods. Verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Please have a great Sabbath, praising and worshiping our Creator and our one true God in spirit and in truth. <laughs>